you so much for giving me this chance to come be part of this group. I'm super excited to be here. I am very sorry about being late. I had it clearly marked on my calendar uh, with the bad time zone conversion. So uh, my apologies for that. Uh, and then, you know, people helpfully sent emails, but I was doing office hours with my students, so not checking my email. So, but thank you for getting through to me, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's also, it's really cool, like, the people on this call are people whose work I learned so much from and look up to, and so it's just a real treat to get to be here. Uh, so, I'll just start with the motivation that all of us are familiar with. The traffic congestion is a big problem we know how to solve, right? Like, the costs... We've all, you know, looked up these numbers that waste time, it waste fuel, it creates all this extra pollution. And, you know, we've been talking about how to solve it for a hundred years now of adding tolls. And why don't we? And, you know, Bob talked about this in his thing is that there's this real concern that adding these tolls in it has major equity problems, right? That it hurts a lot of people and is unfair. My favorite of these quotes that I, you know, I use these many times is this last one which is from a voter in the UK who says, turkeys don't vote for Christmas and motorists won't vote for more taxes to drive. So uh, what I wanna talk about today, uh, and this builds off of very much what Bob said, is that this, the big idea is that only pricing some of the lanes really helps improve the distributional impacts. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that, but the key idea is that by leaving an, an option for people to take where they don't have to pay the toll, that significantly improves the benefit because it means people get to choose for themselves what they want to do. And for someone with a really low value of time who'd rather just sit in traffic, we maintain that choice. Uh, I'm going to show you a theoretical argument as well that if tolling can increase capacity, then actually theoretically pricing a portion of lanes can make everyone better off. I'm also going to highlight several other things uh, that we typically leave out of our theoretical analyses of tolling that really matters. And one of those is the value of reliability. And you know, we have Antonio Bento and Ken Small on this call who have both done really important work measuring this and just showing it's a huge deal <laughs> in when you look at why people pay to use the lanes. Finally, uh, and this also complements Bob's presentation a lot, is that in practice, uh, people of all income classes use these express lanes. And if you just ask them, do you support it, typically, like even low income drivers say, yes, I'm glad to have these lanes available. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, express lanes are about only pricing a portion of the lanes. And so in this picture, this is from SR91 in California, right? You take a highway, you use some sort of barrier and you price some of the lanes, we're leaving some of the lanes unpriced. I'll note, just looking at it right now, you can tell that the downside of express lanes, of pricing only a portion of the lanes, is it means like you're not solving congestion, right? You're making these guys get to avoid congestion, but you know, there's these other four congested lanes that are they're still bad with all those negative pollution and wasted time costs from congestion. Uh, furthermore, in the US at least, these express lanes are growing really quickly. Uh, so using a database put together by the TRB and kind of working to add some things to it, we plot here, we have the year on the x-axis. Notice we go into the future uh, and we have lane miles of express lanes. Uh, this, I will say a weakness of this picture, expansions count as like the year the initial thing was built. Uh, so it's not a perfect chart we made, but you can see, right, like it starts off very small in the mid 90s, but in the next few years, we're gonna be breaking 3000 lane miles of these express lanes. All right, so next, what I want to walk through is just a theoretical argument for why a carefully designed toll on a portion of the lane can help everyone even before the revenue is spent. First, I want to highlight this toll has to be carefully designed. All right, so this toll has to be time varying. Uh, you know, you can't just lovely a flat toll and expect to make everyone better off. It has to be collected electronically so you don't have people stopping uh, to pay the toll. And the important part is that this toll is set to maximize throughput which is very different than maximizing profits and is even different than maximizing social welfare. We're going to do this toll only on a portion of the lane. So that is why these are for express lanes, uh, right? And the big idea of that is we preserve the ability of the lows with a low value of time to choose to not pay the toll. Uh, but now the big idea is that this will give, allow us to help everyone even before you spend the revenue, right? So even if, you know, I talk to some people like, I don't trust the government. I'm like, that's fine. Don't trust the government, <laughs> you know, like you can still help everyone. 
And what's going on is by not pricing all of the, lane, the lanes, we give up some of the potential efficiency gains, right? Like ideally we price all of them, but by doing this, we help everyone. And if doing that allows us to overcome the political opposition to doing tolling, then I think this is a good trade, right? We've been talking for a long time about implementing tolling. Uh, and we've actually had, I mean, right, we can see on that previous slide, we've had some success, uh, but there's still these massive welfare gains available that we've not captured. And so if we can make this more politically appealing, we can make the world a better place by doing the practical instead of the ideal. Uh, why are we able to do this? The big idea is that we're gonna identify a second externality from the traffic engineering literature, which argues that when you get too many cars on the road, they clog up the road and actually reduce capacity. And then by reversing that, we can increase capacity and make everyone better off. So what's this big idea of these two externalities? So I want you to think about a, uh, a two lane highway that at some point goes down to a single lane. So that point, it drops a lane, that's a bottleneck. Typical highway lane can move about 40 vehicles a, second, a minute. So imagine at the start of rush hour, you know, 48 vehicles a minute start down this highway. Well, what happens when they reach that bottleneck? Well, they can't all get through, and so a line forms. And so if I choose to get on the road at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna make that line a little bit longer. That's the standard externality. I get on the road, I slow down everyone else's travel time. However, there's a second thing that can happen. By making that line longer, I can reduce capacity of the bottleneck itself. And so instead of moving 40 vehicles a minute, it might be only moving 36 or 32 vehicles a minute. Traffic engineers have identified two causal mechanisms by which this can happen. The first is at the bottleneck itself. That is that all this lane changing going on can actually reduce capacity. And there's a long literature going back to the 90s kind of documenting that once a bottleneck forms, uh, a queue forms at a bottleneck, the throughput seems to fall by about 10%. I should point out there's some recent research in the economic literature that's saying, hey, maybe not so fast. Uh, maybe there isn't as much evidence for this as we thought. A second reason you see this is that once a queue forms at a bottleneck, that queue is going to grow and it's going to block other traffic. I think the easiest way to see this is to think about your typical highway and think about an off-ramp. Uh, what's at the end of that off-ramp? Well, a traffic light. What happens if too many people are trying to exit the road at one time? Well, that traffic on that exit backs up and it backs up onto the main line of the highway, right? And you just lost the lane of your highway. But of course it gets worse uh, you know, because people aren't just like, oh, you know, I need to exit in a mile. Sure, the right lane's going terribly slow, but I'll get over and wait my turn. No, right? Like, you've all driven on the highway. People are like, hey, I'm going to stay in the left lane to the last second, and then I'll get over, which means these lanes stop. Uh, some places you see this really bad in Chicago, if you're heading in on 290, this is the main highway from the west into downtown. These other highways split north and south, and you'll get this spot where traffic just stops. And then all of a sudden it's better because you pass where people are exiting to go on the north or south highway. This can cause throughput to fall by up to 25%. So the big idea will be, so what will tolling do? So first, let me be clear, what, when I say this is a theoretical argument, the main reason I say that is we have this evidence that too much congestion reduces throughput. And my claim will be, hey, we can add a toll and we can reverse these. But that's a theoretical possibility, right? Until we've actually designed a toll that can reverse these, you know, let's be honest about what we know and what we don't know. Uh, there's a problem here and the hope is that the toll should be able to undo it. Uh, so the idea will be that by delaying some departures, everyone can arrive sooner. And why does that happen? Well, look at a free road. What happens is there's too many cars on the road that leads to queues forming. forming. These queues reduce the highway capacity and lower the throughput. But if we add time varying tolls, we spread out when people depart, right? We tell you, hey, if you wanna to get to work at nine, you no longer have to leave home at eight, you can leave at 8.30 because we've reduced congestion. So we spread out when people leave. Because of that, there's no queue and now there's higher throughput. So I wanna walk you through kind of a more detailed example of how that's possible. And so here we're just gonna kind of map out over the day how things work. So in this picture on the X axis, we have time of day. On the y-axis, we have the departure rate. And let's just go back to our example where a uh, lane can move 40 vehicles a minute. When the road is free, what's gonna happen? Well, let's say 48 people a minute leave at the start of rush hour. 
And then at some, and during this time, notice, right, there's eight more people leaving than can get through. Because there's more people leaving than can get through, a Q forms. Because the Q forms, throughput's gonna fall. Throughput falls, for the sake of the picture, let's call that 32. So now, right here, we have this vertical gap. We have a Q forming, travel time's getting longer and longer. We know at some point, right, travel times start falling. So there's a period of time when fewer people leave that can get through. And now we have a gap between how many people can get through and how many people are entering. So now the length of the queue is shrinking. And so travel times are falling. So what do we have at the start of the day? Travel times are really short. They peak at 8.30 and then they keep falling until 9.20. Notice, all right, like this comes from a simple model, but just so that, like notice how this could be an equilibrium when everyone's identical, you say some guy get, leaves really early, that's painful. You don't like getting to work early, uh, but you had no travel time. So you have a bad thing, uh, getting to work really early, and a good thing, low travel times. And you're indifferent between that combination and leaving at 8.30 when you get to work right on time, a good thing, but really high travel time. So travel times are evolving over the day so that people are willing to travel at 7 o'clock or 8.30 or 9.20. What happens when we add a toll? We're going to use a time varying toll in order to affect the rate at which drivers depart. So we're going to charge a toll that encourages drivers instead of having 48 per minute leaving, only 40 of you. Right? So now we have exactly as many, and so this decreases departures at the start, increases departures at the end. And now we have cars showing up at exactly the rate the highway can handle. Why does this help? Well, now we avoid a queue forming. Because we avoid a queue forming, we've increased throughput. And this means that holding constant the number of travelers, rush hour itself can be shorter, right? So instead of the first guy leaving at seven o'clock, the first driver doesn't leave till 7.25. Likewise, at the end, it can shift in a little bit. Now you say, well, of course, Jonathan, we know more people will travel. All right, sure, as long as like, you don't have perfectly elastic demand for travel, which you know, we can talk about. Uh, you know, it's not going to go back to where it was. And this gives you the first look at the distributional impacts of tolling in a world where everyone's the same and, you know, but tolling can increase throughput. And what you do is you notice, look, the first guy used to leave at seven o'clock. He paid no toll because the road was free. And he had uh, no extra travel time due to congestion because he was the first guy on the road. All right, what's his situation now? Now he leaves at 7.25. Uh, he still faces no congestion. Uh, because he's the very first driver on the road, the optimal toll is actually zero. But now he reduces how early he was by 25 minutes. So this driver is better off. Now, if everyone's the same, then if one driver is better off, everyone must be better off. And so we've made everyone better off in a world where everyone's the same. Now, of course, not everyone's the same, right? That's the whole reason this is a big problem is that drivers are different. So what happens when we price the entire road? Well, the good news is we increase speed and throughput. The bad news is that we change the currency used to allocate really desirable arrival times from time to money. That is, if someone wants to get to work right during the peak of rush hour, when the roads are free, they pay by sitting in traffic. When the roads are told, they pay by paying a toll. But not everyone values that trade-off the same. And this is gonna hurt some drivers and help others. So how does pricing only a portion of the lanes help? Well, you know, in my, I have an academic paper that says it in like all of its glory. So I'm just gonna give you the intuition now, which is when you have a road where both lanes are free. All right, they're both free. So in general, they're gonna be congested. Because they're congested and have queues, the throughput's low. Because they have long queues, they have long travel times. And these two lanes are the same, so they carry each half the traffic. What happens when you price one of the lanes? Well, you add a time varying toll in this lane. Because you've added this time varying toll, the average queue is zero, right? We have this perfectly designed toll that gets the queue exactly to zero. This can increase throughput. This lowers travel time in the price lane. And because we've increased throughput, because we've added this toll, it means the toll lane carries more than its fair share of traffic. How does that apply to the free lane? Well, what we've done is we've reduced the number of cars in the free lane. And for all the standard reasons, that means traffic's better in the free lane. So you look at someone in the toll lane, so you look at someone in the free lane, they're better off because they have lower travel time than they did before. 
look at someone in the tall lane, while they could have stayed in the free lane but chose not to, they must be better off. Uh, I want to say, like, this simple model ignores what I've showed you, ignores some reasons this might still fail. Um, but the logic holds, and then I end up showing kind of I, I look at data from SR91 and say, what are driver's preferences really like? Is this actually possible given what I estimate for driver's preferences? And what I find is if we let drivers differ on two dimensions, uh, three dimensions, but I'm only going to focus. In the model, they differ in inflexibility. That is, high inflexibility that I really got to get to work right on time. Low inflexibility is like an academic who says, you know, I can show up early. It doesn't really matter. Value of time, right? So down here, we have someone who has a low income and a low value of time. Someone up here with a high value of time. They also differ in what time they want to get to work. And this picture plots how much better or worse they are if you plot, if you told the entire row. What you see is you really hurt the inflexible poor and you help the inflexible rich, right? And people who are really flexible don't care, right? So blue is better off, red is worse off. So if you price all the lanes, even if you can increase capacity, you still really hurt the inflexible poor because they just don't want to pay the toll. What happens if you only price half the lanes? Key thing, so the picture is basically the same in the axes. So over here is the inflexible poor. Uh, here are the flexible poor, inflex, uh, flexible rich, inflexible rich, right? So you have like lawyers and investment bankers over here. You might have shift workers down here. Uh, and, you know, this is like your rich academics and your poor academics. And the key thing is we've gotten rid of all of the red. And so you make some people better off and the poor are no worse off. The numbers you get from doing this with data from SR91 are pretty big that if you price all of the lanes, the worst off driver is hurt by over $2,000 a year. But if you only price half the lanes, you can reduce that harm to zero. Uh, and the, but, so by only pricing half the lanes, you do give up some of the social welfare gains, that's the second row, uh, but you still get most, you get more than half of it. I do wanna highlight, like so far I focused on what can you do to make everyone better off. Uh, so this chart I use, uh, a conservative assumption for how much tolling can increase capacity. So I, it's lower than in the other one. And I say, look, look on the x-axis. This is the fraction of lanes price. Y-axis is the percent of a maximum. And I'm going to plot two things. Say, look, if you price all the lanes, you do the maximum harm, but you get the maximum welfare gain. And notice as you reduce the fraction of lanes price, the maximum harm done drops quickly, but you still capture a large share of the social welfare gain. So look, making everyone better off, it's a really high standard, right? Like that's really demanding. Maybe we think, you know, look, we can't, you know, we can't increase capacity as much as you might hope, uh, but still by pricing only a portion of the lanes, you can reduce the harm done by like 75% while still getting more than half the benefit. Now what I've shown you so far avoids a lot of things that we could do that would make it even better. Right, so what are the three kind of big categories? One is that we've ignored so far using the revenue and what I've presented. I've ignored ways you could let the flexible poor pay with time to travel at the peak. That is, where, why did we really hurt the poor? Is that we said we're taking the inflexible poor and if we add a toll, it makes it that they have to pay with money and they don't want to do that. And finally, and I think probably most underlooked is this value of reliability. So you said the revenue and like governments are already being smart about this, right? Uh, you can subsidize tolls for low-income drivers. In theory, you could do negative tolls. Uh, you can cut other regressive taxes. You can subsidize public transit, or you can use the money to pay to improve the highway, right? One way you could increase capacity on the highway is adding a new one. There's also ways to let the inflexible poor pay with their time to travel at the peak instead of paying a toll. Uh, notice public transportation counts as this, right? Public transit, you've got to wait for your bus. It takes longer. But then you can travel in these express lanes and gain benefit from those travel time savings. These carpooling is another way that people can choose to pay with their time to get a discount on the toll, right? Carpooling, again, it's annoying to organize and things, but you can do it. Probably the most important of these, though, is this value of reliability. Uh, so Antonio on this call has this awesome paper where he looks at, you know, if you look at when people choose to use these express lanes, you find their willingness to pay is like crazy. They're willing to pay, you know, like over $100 an hour for the time they're saving. So what would rationalize that is, you know, you're running late for a meeting. 
And saving those five minutes is really valuable, right? Like getting over that threshold of being on time versus late is incredibly valuable. Uh, Ken Small has this awesome paper looking also at SR91, value, estimates that the value of reliability accounts for a huge share of the value that people get from these express lanes. And one reason I think this really matters is, right, as like Bob mentioned, like what we see in practice is that a lot of people use the lanes occasionally, right? Which says, I'm not using it because I want to save kind of time on an everyday basis. I'm using it for those days where it really matters. And because everyone has days like that, it means even if you have a low income driver who's maybe hurt by tolling nine days out of 10, maybe that benefit, that one day out of 10, is more than enough to offset those costs. Uh, so, this was, so, you know, so next I want to switch to what do low income drivers actually think about express lanes? And so in the paper we sent out, you know, I have a table, we kind of try to collect this across a number of express lanes in the United States. But to summarize the table, on average, about 24% of the users are low income. And that can be often as high as 61%. I should know, you know, what counts as low income differs across different studies. And what's just going on is even people who are poor can have a high value of time. And even people who are, who are poor have days when they really need to be on time. Next, you can ask, do low-income drivers actually like the express lanes? Uh, this was harder to find kind of data on. Different studies do it differently. But across eight different facilities, there were six where if you, you actually ask low-income drivers, do you like this? They say yes. Uh, in some of these cases, you would even find that there'd be a survey question that says to everyone, do you think express lanes are unfair to the poor? You might have a majority that says yes. But then you ask the poor, do you like this? And they also say yes. Uh, and I should be clear that this is based on how it's actually implemented, right? Which includes things like uh, discounted tolls and subsidized transit and things like that. Uh, so what is the conclusion? So we all know traffic congestion is a big problem, but a major benefit of doing the express lanes where we only toll some of the lanes is that it can really improve the distributional impacts. The benefit of that is that it means we can really push forward with implementing these kind of tolls. Uh, why does it help? Well, it helps because it allows drivers to choose whether or not they want to pay a toll. And so really, just to highlight, the key idea is to give people a choice of whether to pay a toll or not. Notice in areas where you have a dense network of highways, that could mean you toll some highways and not others, right? There's other ways of getting this idea that you don't have to pay a toll. So that it's theoretically possible for express lanes to help all drivers. Uh, and the big thing this depends on is whether tolling can increase highway capacity. I want to note that in kind of what I did, I was assuming this was a conversion of an existing lane. If you use money from tolls to build a new lane, well then, yes, you increase capacity, right? And so in those cases, this toll, uh, if you build new capacity with the revenue raised, then you have made all drivers better off. Uh, and finally, I've showed in practice, low-income drivers in the U.S. both use and like express lanes. Thank you very much.